The Wisconsin Music Hall Hour presents a special transcribed broadcast of Wisconsin's 92nd Founders Day program. Greetings to you all, wherever you may be tonight. Only one year has slipped away since Founders Day of 1940. But we live in an unbelievably different world. Little did we in the field of education realize that by the time the school year opened in the fall, we would be discussing with our students their place in national defense. America, both young and old, must know its own history and background. Our history and traditions must be thoroughly understood and liberally interpreted if they are to serve their rightful and invaluable purpose as a protector and preserver of fundamental principles and as a treasure chest of practical experience for our use and guidance. To me, it's clear that a first and all important responsibility is the preservation for future generations of the benefits and blessings that we of this generation have had and still enjoy. We must recognize the fact that these privileges came to us only through the sacrifices of others. We may well be in agreement on end but at the same time differ widely on the means to be used. Let us cherish the opportunity to differ and to express these differences. Good evening. I'm Sarah Schutt, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to spend a couple of minutes with you ahead of tonight's UW Now program. This Friday, February 5th, marks the 172nd anniversary of the first day of classes at UW-Madison, what we call Founders Day. And while Founders Day refers to the beginnings of University of Wisconsin in 1849, it's important to acknowledge that the university occupies land that is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk people, which they were forced to cede in 1832. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the other 11 First Nations of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin Alumni Association and our alumni chapters have been recognizing February 5th as the university's Founders Day since the early part of the 20th century. And I wanna give special recognition to all of our alumni chapters and volunteer leaders around the world who ordinarily would be gathering in person during this season. I'm so glad we could be together virtually tonight. The voices you heard to open the program were from 80 years ago, Founders Day 1941, about 10 months before the US entered World War II. At that time, the university, UW alumni and people around the world faced fear and uncertainty about their future and judging by some of the dialogue, some of the same concerns that we face today. I was struck by the similarity to our situation today. As we continue to navigate the impact of a global pandemic, a movement for social justice and challenges to our democratic institutions. But there's a hopeful message that emerges from that 1941 broadcast and our current situation. And that's the focus of our program tonight. That message, is that UW-Madison endures and continues to make a positive and significant impact on our world. Through pandemics, wars, economic crises, and transformational social movements, UW-Madison stands strong and keeps moving forward. Thanks in large part to all of you, our diverse global network of alumni and donors, your passion, spirit, advocacy, and generosity have built the foundation that will continue to keep UW-Madison the excellent and enduring institution it has come to be. And I believe the gentleman in the, in the audio clip from the class of 1901 referred to that as our blessings. That is all truly something to celebrate. Thank you. Tonight's program highlights three outstanding UW faculty members whose research and work demonstrates the impact of the Wisconsin idea, espouses the ideals of sifting and winnowing, and exemplifies the excellence of UW-Madison. 
Now it's time to turn to the UW Now program, but be sure to stay tuned in until the end for a special video presentation. It's my pleasure to welcome our moderator, host of our UW Now Live series, and our president and CEO of the Wisconsin Foundation and Alumni Association, Mike Kinetter. Thank you, welcome Mike. Thank you, Sarah, and happy Founders Day, everyone. It's great to be here and it's great to be able to celebrate Founders Day with this special UW Now edition. Since that first day of class on February 5th, 1849, UW has grown to be one of the top research universities in the world. And tonight you're gonna to get a taste of why that is. Joining us are three UW faculty members who will tell us about their groundbreaking research. Nam Kim, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. Young Mei Kim, a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and a faculty affiliate in the Department of Political Science. And Kristen Masters, a Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor Romnus Faculty Fellow and the Department Chair in Biomedical Engineering. Thank you all for making time to be with our alumni and friends for this Founders Day edition. Leading us off tonight will be Professor Masters. As noted, she is the Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor, Romnus Faculty Fellow, and Department Chair in the College of Engineering. In Masters Lab, researchers combine engineering tools with biological knowledge to create tissue engineered models of disease with a specific focus on cardiovascular dysfunction and cancer. Her research includes in vitro disease modeling, cardiovascular disease pathogenesis and treatment, and tumor tissue engineering. Kristen received her BS at the University of Michigan and her PhD from Rice University. And we are glad you found your way to Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us, Professor Masters. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you and you can walk us through some insights into your work. Great, thank you so much, Mike. So I'm really delighted to be here tonight, especially for this special edition uh, to celebrate Founders Day. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research, if I can get my slides up. Thank you. Okay, so what I do is called tissue engineering. And in tissue engineering, we are trying to make brand new tissues in the lab. And this is an endeavor that started um, you know, before I was a researcher, probably about 30 years ago, but I have been doing tissue engineering for about 20 years. And originally this goal, you might have heard it called organs in a dish, but it was to make you know brand new organs or tissues to serve as replacements for damaged or diseased tissues. But we're taking a little bit of a different spin on it. And what we do is we actually try to make diseased tissues. And you may be wondering why, why would you want to make tissues they're diseased when you know the, the need is in trying to replace these, these diseased tissues in people. And the reason for that is that making disease tissues in the lab could actually help us better understand why diseases happen. So that's understand disease pathogenesis. It could help us identify new treatments and it could help us test new treatment strategies. So in a way we could actually be doing tissue engineering to avoid doing tissue engineering. If we can figure out how the disease happens before the organ needs replacing, then that would be an ideal outcome. And so our vision here is that we want to make disease tissues in the lab so we can identify new ways to treat disease. We also think it can be a way to reduce the use of animals in research. And we want to improve the success of drugs that are tested preclinically with the idea that if we have human tissues, we can perhaps have a better predictor of human dr drug response. So one of the diseases that we really like studying is calcific aortic valve disease or CAVD. And in this disease, your valve that starts out looking like this on the left ends up getting really occluded um, so that it looks like the valve on the right. And this is a really prevalent disease that happens in over a quarter of individuals over age 65. And it's, it has some uh, you know, bad outcomes to it as well. And your know, risk factors for it are uh, age, being male, high cholesterol, as well as smoking. But most importantly for our work, 
is that there is actually no treatment for this disease. The only treatment for it is a total valve replacement by surgery. And so what our goal is, is to try to understand what comes first in valve disease. So there's a lot unknown about how that valve becomes diseased. What we know are that all these things I have listed in the bottom of this slide, you don't need to know exactly what they are, but I can tell you if you want. Um, all these things in the bottom of the slide we know are in, a, in an end stage diseased valve, but we don't know the order in which they got there and which one is say necessary for the next step. And so what we try to do is we are taking cells plus scaffolds that we make in the lab to try to recreate these disease processes so we can understand which thing comes first, what leads to what event. And once we understand what leads to what event, now we can start to think about, okay, what are ways that we can target this event from triggering uh, and prevent it from triggering the next event? But you may be wondering, okay, but how do I make that scaffold? And the scaffold is based upon all the components that are naturally in your tissue. And some of these words might look familiar to you, actually, if you've ever looked at the label of various skincare products, things like collagen one, hyaluronic acid, chondritin sulfate. Those are all things that uh, you know are in skincare products because they're important components of lots of tissues in your body not just the skin, but also your valve. And so we make our scaffolds that we put our cells in to represent what's in the native tissue. And so we take that scaffold that we've made in our lab, we put cells in it, and then we put it in environments where we can mimic all these other things that we see in disease and try to figure out their sequence. And so, what we can end up with then is creating these disease scaffolds. And from that, we can get all this information about the, the, the stream of impacts and effects of all these different things happening that we can't actually see in a person when it's happening, but we can see in a lab when we're taking this tissue and analyzing the steps along the way. And so using these models, this is how we can start to decipher the sequence and understand how can we target the sequence so that we can prevent it from progressing. One of the really interesting things that we're studying too is the fact that the sequence happens differently in males versus females. Um, and in fact, male cells consistent with men having more valvular disease than women, uh, the male cells themselves from the valves actually behave differently than cells taken from a female valve. So it's not just a whole systemic issue, but it's actually down right to the cellular level that uh, the male versus female effects can occur. Well, I'll just sip, spend you know two more minutes on talking about one other disease that we look at that a lot of people are familiar with as well, and that is breast cancer. It is the most common cancer in U.S. women. It is responsible for you know a high level of mortality, and the way that breast cancer proceeds is that you have um, the the tumor cells invading other tissues and metastasizing there to create new tumors. And the most important target for our treatment or for our investigations in this disease are that eight out of nine drugs tested in animals fail in humans. And so that's something that motivates us to now create models of these tumors, trying to understand um, how the cells invade their surrounding environment. One of the things that were one of the questions that we're interested in is why are stiffer tumors more malignant? Why do they tend to invade their surroundings a little bit more aggressively than softer tumors? And how can we use that to better target drugs to treat individuals? So that's our vision and hopefully our impact. And of course, none of this would be possible without uh, some highly talented and wonderful students and uh, scientists and technicians who do all of the work in the lab. So thank you. Professor Masters, that was a rapid tour through some, I'm sure very complex work that you and your team are doing. Um, I'm just curious, you know, I'm sure our viewers are, when they think of the College of Engineering, they don't necessarily think of the kind of work that you're doing necessarily biomedical engineering is a little different. How big is the department? 
We have almost 20 faculty in our department right now. And in fact, my lab is actually located at the medical school, not within engineering, even though I am 100% engineering appointment. Wow. So did you choose Rice University for your PhD because they were particularly good at this kind of work? That is one of the reasons, yes. Although, honestly, my, uh, my guiding principles for choosing graduate school are finding an advisor and a mentor that are a good fit for you and that a good advisor or mentor will help you become um, passionate about almost any kind of research. <laughs> well, I would hope that students are flocking to biomedical engineering at Wisconsin now that you're here. Um, how do you find the interdisciplinary research environment at UW? This, you know, a lot of places claim to be collaborative, but I do find that UW-Madison really walks the walk in that respect. It is, it is such an enriching collaborative atmosphere. I, I particularly enjoy my, uh, my physical location on campus because my floor, actually, I'm the only engineer and I'm mixed in with MDs, MD, PhDs, four different departments, and we all sort of you know, cross-fertilize in terms of ideas and troubleshooting. It's really quite lovely. That's great to hear. Do you, uh, how often do you encounter unexpected findings in your work? <laughs> so my secret is that my whole research avenue was an unexpected finding. When I first started here, I as an assistant professor, this is 17 years ago, and my goal was to make healthy tissue engineered heart valves. And my, my first PhD student, she was culturing these valve cells and he looked diseased, he looked terrible. And she was frustrated and I was frustrated and she was worried she'd never get her PhD. I was worried I'd never get tenure. And, <laughs> and then we had this aha moment of why not capitalize on what we're doing well, which is making diseased valves actually. And that set the stage for literally the rest of my career. Wow. Well, that, that is a fascinating little backstory to uh, what has been a great career. So congratulations on all your achievements. Uh, very great to have you at the University of Wisconsin. And, and thanks for taking time for us tonight. We'll, uh, we'll watch for additional viewer questions and bring you back on uh, after our next two speakers, if that's OK. Super. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Our next speaker tonight is Professor Nam Kim an anthropological archeologist with research interests in the sociopolitical complexity, ancient cities, and the relationship between modern politics, cultural heritage, and the material record. Currently, he conducts ongoing archeological field work in Vietnam at the Koh Loa settlement, a heavily fortified ancient city located near modern day Hanoi. Koloa is connected to Vietnamese legendary accounts and viewed by many as integral to the genesis of Vietnamese civilization. Nam received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Nam, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we look forward to hearing about now something completely different from <laughs> Professor Master's work. That's uh, right. Equally fascinating. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, it is such an honor to be a part of uh, this very special Founders Day event. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, I am an anthropological archeologist. Uh, I have prior training in international relations and political science uh, before eventually landing in anthropology. I've had the privilege of doing field work in different countries around the world, uh, including Belgium, Mexico, Guatemala, even the United States uh, before working uh, more, most recently in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam specifically. Uh, these experiences have allowed me to bring in um, ways to, to connect my students with different cultures, different time periods, and histories from all over the globe. Uh, and this is sort of in keeping with the general spirit of the Wisconsin idea uh, and just trying to help them to, to be inspired and to see themselves as global citizens uh, and not as, as just students. My goal is to share with them how past social environments uh, have led to the present, our present day circumstances in whatever society we may be living in, and how deeper engagements with that past can help us to anticipate our, our shared futures. Uh, I consider myself a lifelong student with perhaps way too many interests, uh, but two of the main ones that I'd like to, to focus on today would be uh, one, early civilizations, and two, research on violence and warfare. And these research interests have been heavily influenced by my own personal journey, my, my family's personal history. 
Uh, so my father is Korean and my mother is Vietnamese and both experienced war at very young ages. So their families were displaced, forced to abandon homes and flee ancestral lands um, in their respective countries of, of Korea and Vietnam during the 1940s and 1950s. Now, as fate would have it, they met in Saigon in the 1960s uh, during the height of the Vietnam conflict. They got married and I was born in 1974 in Saigon. Um, but a year later, they were forced to flee war one more time, and this time with me uh, in tow. As we escaped by helicopter off the rooftop of the USA aid building on April 29th, 1975. Uh, of course, I don't remember any of this, um, but it's been recounted to me many times. Um, but this was the day before Saigon toppled and before the collapse of the state of South Vietnam. To make a long story short, we ended up as refugees in the United States. And I grew up fascinated by the stories uh, about our family's histories in Asia and how war had so profoundly shaped uh, the trajectories of our lives. Uh, next slide, please. So in this way, my family history has influenced my intellectual passions. And with the first one, um, I've been doing field work and studying the underpinnings of quote unquote Vietnamese civilization. And I've been excavating at a particular site known as Goloa, located in the Red River Delta of Vietnam, up in the north, just outside the modern-day capital of, of Hanoi. So Koh Loa emerged as a capital city uh, and maybe the earliest example of a city in Vietnamese history over 2,000 years ago. And in my work, I'm trying to figure out the emergence of the ancient society, how people lived, their life ways, the ways in which they interacted with their social and environmental surroundings. Um, interestingly, they're, they're, as you alluded to earlier, like uh, there, there are histories and legends that are tied with, to this site. And many of these legendary accounts are not unlike the tales that you hear about from other places, uh, like King Arthur, for instance, tales of Excalibur, uh, Camelot, and the Lady of the Lake. There are analogous kinds of stories here with this particular site. There is a legendary king who may have been the, res the one responsible for the construction of this capital city. So in very similar ways, Goloa is to Vietnam what Camelot might be to the United Kingdom. Uh, next slide, please. So I've been collaborating with uh, Vietnamese archaeologists for quite some time now on the excavating the remains of this city, which is massive in size. It's about six square kilometers, uh, roughly 1,100 football fields in size. I have to give a plug out to the Badgers, of course. You see Randall, Camp Randall right there. Uh, but Goloa is unprecedented in terms of its size and scale in the region's prehistory. And despite that, um, many people outside of Vietnam have never heard about this site. So in our ongoing collaborations, we're trying to answer questions about the site's history using different methods such as surveys and excavations, uh, paleoenvironmental reconstructions to give us ideas about what the conditions may have been like at the time that the city begins to emerge. And I'm also trying to raise awareness about the site outside of the country uh, through publications and our ongoing field work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one fascinating aspect of this research has been to, uh, th this kind of intersection between modern day identity and politics and national history and the material record. And so to illustrate, during our excavations, we often were visited by scholars, uh, foreign researchers, the general public, but also national political figures, uh, such as the deputy prime minister and the former president of Vietnam, who were very interested in what was coming out of the ground. And part of this is because of the prominent uh, place that the site holds within Vietnamese history and national imagination. So lots of people are interested in Goloa's history. It is a source of national pride and it is quite celebrated. Um, on the screen, you can see some of those images. On the upper left, there is uh, a photo of na uh, inter uh, annual festivals that are held to commemorate the founding of, of Vietnam, the founding kingdom that's associated with the site and so forth. Uh, we can see the king prominently featured in textbooks. Uh, we can see him uh, in, in video games. In fact, this is an image I found just recently uh, on the web. But that gives you an idea of the kinds of interest that people have in the site. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the other aspect of my research that, that I'm very interested in has to do with warfare. And this has to do with both present day context as well as past context. And I'm very interested in the manifestations of violence and warfare as we can see them in different cultural domains, whether that's in politics, economics, religion, 
or other cultural areas. Uh, one of the big questions that, that is of interest is how far back does warfare go in human history and whether or not it might be tied to our own biology? Is it embedded in us as a species? Next slide, please. So archaeologists use a variety of methods and frameworks to try to get at data to answer these kinds of questions about warfare, especially in the prehistoric past where we don't have a lot of textual evidence to help guide us. In trying to understand warfare's antiquity and how it might be uh, playing a role in social uh, change over time. So these kinds of materials include uh, site features, trauma and skeletal remains, artifacts. Uh, we also use observations of present day communities as analogs, um, even the behaviors of primates. These can all be part of a larger corpus of data that we use. Uh, next slide, please. There is ongoing and very intense debate about the origins of warfare. And just to kind of encapsulate this, some argue that the origins would be in historically recent eras. Others see much older origins. Some say it's learned behavior. Some say that it's part of our own biology, that we've evolved, in fact, to be violent. Now, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Kissel, who's over at Appalachian State University, uh, we recently published a book that brings together some of our anthropological perspectives on warfare's time depth and its relationship to humanity. Uh, incidentally, Dr. Kissel got his PhD right here in Madison, just another plug for our campus. Um, but for our part, we think it's very useful to broaden our thinking beyond just the origins of warfare and to begin looking at other things and other questions. We contemplate when we start to become what we might consider ultra social or ultra cooperative, highly and efficiently cooperative, uh, which in our minds open the door for warfare related behaviors. So in the end, we see a very important and vital connection between these concerns and any hopes that we might have as a world for conflict avoidance, for building institutions of peace. Uh, for us, the past shows us that conditions of uncertainty, of perceived inequality, these kinds of conditions and perceptions can lead to unrest, heightened tensions, and of course, outbreaks of conflict. Um, but what I'm hopeful is that there are studies of the past that can help provide insights as we strive to cultivate peace in various kinds of cultural practices, in our attitudes about, about peace and violence and in our societies. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna conclude and I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have about any of this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, you know, what an amazing life story, uh, first of all. And uh, I, I personally was not aware until we uh, got connected through this uh, of your incredible personal experience. and. You know, as an American myself, I, I had the opportunity to be in Vietnam on a couple of occasions professionally as an academic. And then again, uh, I took my family on a trip there. And the most striking thing, and I've heard many people comment on this, is just how gracious the Vietnamese people are. You know, uh, the first time going over there as an American, you know, you're not so sure exactly how people will view you. And, um, you know, I, I just think the, the way in which they seem to be able to separate, you know, the conflicts that may exist between governments from our own individual humanity is really something striking. And I wonder how how are you received uh, coming back as someone who was born in Vietnam and left uh, in those dire circumstances? Yeah, um, that that's it, it's an excellent observation and comment uh, about the Vietnamese people uh, that you that you've made. Um, from from my own personal experience, it, it's been it's been a privilege to be able to work there, and it it was something that we never expected would happen. When we left the country, my parents uh, I think had no concept of ever going back, and there was no idea that I would ever be going back even, and to do work there. Um, but to be able to work on early Vietnamese history has been such an honor. And what I have found is the first time I went back was in 2005 as, as a graduate student, just to explore the possibility of doing research there. And the people that I met, uh, my, my colleagues at various institutions who are archeologists, um, they were extremely welcoming. As soon as they realized that we had similar kinds of research interests, as soon as they realized that I had some ancestry and that it was easy to communicate, uh, because there, there's some English, there was some English at that point in time, but not a ton. But because I had a little bit of Vietnamese knowledge, 
um, it made things so much easier. And I've just found the doors just open immediately and people were quite gracious. And I think very similar to the kind of experience that you've had in visiting. Um, but the war happened. There's no, there's no denying that it, it has had an effect. There are no, at the time there were no Americans doing any kind of archeology span in Vietnam whatsoever. Um, so it, there are challenges, uh, but there are also all kinds of wonderful opportunities. Well, I regret to inform you, the parents have crashed the party. We got a question from Steve Ackerman, Dean of the Graduate School. Okay. Uh, Vice Chancellor for Research. Uh, are legendary kings associated more with times of war or times of peace? Hmm. That's an excellent question. I think they can be significant in either kinds of context, um, and for various reasons, obviously. One would choose to invoke them or raise the stories to use as sort of rallying points. Uh, in times of conflict, they could be very important to unite people, to kind of band together for a common purpose, to serve as a sense of identity. But during times of peace, they can be a way to celebrate and memorialize history as well. And so um, I think that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm not sure how I would answer that. Um, I, I think it's context dependent. Sorry to hedge there could call for further research. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Professor Kim. We'll come back to you with more questions after our final speaker wraps up. But uh, that was really fascinating tour through your work. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Young May Kim, a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication and a faculty affiliate of the Department of Political Science. Professor Kim is an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and her research concerns media and politics in the age of data-driven digital media, specifically the role digital media play in political communication among political leaders, non-party groups, and citizens. She received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and was a visiting fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Professor Kim, thanks for joining us. You work on a very hot topic, and I'm sure you have a lot of requests these days, and we really appreciate you sharing your insights with our alumni tonight. Thank you for the nice introduction, Mike. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to present my research. Um, on January 6, uh, 2020, uh, when the Electoral College vote count was just the beginning, Thousands of extremists voluntarily, uh, violently attacked the U.S. Capitol. The terrifying assault was widely condemned by political leaders as well as the majority of the general public. Mitch McConnell uh, called the storming of the Capitol uh, a failed insurrection. Uh, many journalists and researchers linked the riot uh, to election disinformation, such as uh, the QAnon's conspiracy theory. Today, I will talk about some patterns and trends of election uh, disinformation uh, and highlight them as like five things to know about election disinformation. The findings I will highlight today are based on my empirical research project, uh, Project Data, uh, Digital Ad Tracking and Analysis. Project Data is an interdisciplinary research group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, that tracks and analyzes like digital ads and linked uh, organic messages. Uh, in 2016, we collected 87 million ads exposed to about 17,000 consented participants across uh, multiple platforms like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and Google. Um, the data was collected for two weeks prior to the, each of the state's primary uh, primaries and six weeks prior to the general elections. Uh, in 2020, uh, although a smaller number of participants, uh, we have been tracking uh, organic posts as well as uh, digital ads people are exposed to a uh, uh, week before and after the election day. So total of about like, six weeks. Uh, so my team investigates the sources uh, or sponsors uh, and the content and targets of digital campaigns focusing on election disinformation. Um, we follow the federal and state uh, state protocols uh, protocols for the protection of user data privacy and security. 
Okay, so number one, uh, election disinformation includes uh, more than outright lies or false news. So disinformation is defined as misleading information that has the function of misleading someone. Uh, and it often uh, the source or sponsors is systematically like a benefits from their being uh, misleading. So uh, it takes various forms with the varying uh, goals and strategies and tactics. Some of the major election disinformation includes conspiracy theories such as QAnon, uh, state-backed voting influence campaigns like a Russian election interference. Um, for example, this is one of the posts found on Instagram ahead of the 2020 presidential elections. Um, it is based on QN and conspiracy theory, uh, but it turns out it was part of a Russian election interference in the 2020 election. Uh, election disinformation also includes the voter suppression campaigns that are designed to suppress vote turnout, especially the turnout from the opposition. Uh, voter suppression is especially problematic because it infringes uh, one of the most basic rights uh, guaranteed by the Constitution, the right to vote. Voter suppression campaigns include various types, uh, for example, like a voter intimidation or a threat, uh, or the deception about the time, place, and manner of voting. A few days ago, a social media influencer was charged with election interference because he engaged in a voter suppression campaign that solicited voters to cast their votes by text. On the election day in 2020, at least 800,000 residents in swing states received robocalls telling to stay safe and stay home. Number two, uh, election disinformation is disseminated and sponsored by foreign and domestic actors. Uh, and more importantly, the line between foreign and domestic uh, actors becomes uh, blurred. So election information disseminators and sponsors like, include foreign actors, uh, but also undisclosed election campaigns, uh, which include uh, nonprofits who did not file a report to the Federal Election Commission, uh, unregistered groups uh, that did not have any uh, record uh, in the FEC or uh, Internet Revenue Service uh, data, or unidentifiable or untraceable groups uh, that basically exist on like a Facebook only, for example. Um, so this is one of the examples of this suspicious, like, unidentifiable, untraceable groups. Uh, it has very generic descriptions, like here, like, you know, community, uh, people who care about the uh, care about the U.S. Uh, things like that. Uh, and uh, in 2016 uh, elections, uh, we found that more than 50% of the groups and sponsors were suspicious groups, uh, meaning that they are not identifiable and not traceable. Uh, and the volume of ads generated by these undisclosed groups that includes unidentifiable groups and unregistered groups and nonprofits who did not file a report to FEC was four times larger than that of the FEC groups. Um, a notable trend in the 2020 election campaign is relatively increased the salience of the extremist and the hate groups. It's so probably because like, other actors, like foreign actors, are more regulated by like, platforms in 2020 uh, compared to the 2016 elections. Um, at this point, uh, it is unclear uh, whether these voting actors were simply stealing the names or logos and materials already used by uh, listed organizations. But uh, the interesting and important finding is that many of these extremist and hate groups uh, were used by like, a Russian election interference into, uh, in the 2020 presidential election. Um, Despite the platform's increased uh, self-regulatory measures, uh, our preliminary analysis of the 2020 election data uh, revealed that about 800 far-right extremists or hate groups 
uh, out of like about like 4,000 uh, sponsors uh, engaged in the campaigns. Um, that was like a real like a 20%, nearly 20% of the sponsors um, in the data. And then about 27% of our study participants were exposed to those extremists and hate groups during the study period, which was uh, six weeks before and after uh, the election day. Number three, different segments of the voting age population are targeted with the different campaign messages. Uh, so election disinformation is micro-targeted. Um, overall, disinformation is concentrated uh, in the battleground states. Uh, in 2016, for example, undisclosed groups of divisive issue campaigns clearly targeted battleground states, uh, including Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Virginia. Um, and vulnerable targets of election disinformation include uh, older people, white voters, uh, and conservatives and Republicans, and that they are targeted with like, anti-immigration, nationalism, uh, and racial conflict uh, messages, and in particular in this year, uh, border fraud uh, disinformation. Uh, on the other hand, voter suppression messages like, clearly targeted non-white voters, uh, especially non-white voters in the battleground states. In 2016, for example, white voters uh, compared to other racial ethnic groups were highly targeted with the issue of immigration. Uh, white voters received 45% more uh, immigrants, uh, immigration as than the average of the voting age population. Um, on the other hand, not white voters were targeted with the voter suppression ads. Uh, for example, like the targeting African Americans, this ad says no one represents black people, so don't go to vote, uh, boycott the election. Number four, disinformation disseminators, disseminators, disseminators and sponsors exploit sharp political divisions already existing in our society. Um, election disinformation centers around uh, divisive and wet issues, uh, targeting those who are likely to be interested in a particular issue, but dis dissatisfied with the current party platforms uh, on those issues. Um, disinformation disseminators uh, create like an us versus them kind of discourse. Uh, feeding fear to activate uh, or demobilize like a certain uh, segment of the population uh, who consider a particular issue personally important. So my analysis of disinformation in recent elections like, found that uh, racial conflict, uh, American patriot uh, patriotism or nationalism, uh, immigration, especially anti-Muslim messages, uh, urban versus like a rural divide and gun right issues are most frequently used uh, in uh, the disinformation campaigns, uh, along with uh, high, high partisan divide. Number five, uh, many uh, researchers uh, and pundits believe that we learned a hard lesson from the capital attack earlier this year. Um, anecdotal evidence suggests that the widespread disinformation and voter fraud uh, led to uh, organizing violent protests uh, like a capital assault. Um, in fact, since just a couple of uh, days after the election day uh, in 2020, I spotted a significant number of Facebook posts by extremists uh, or hate groups that mobilized the Stop the Steal protests and rallies uh, including violent ones like this one. Uh, let them know we will no longer be silent and would not stand by uh, and let them steal our country. BLM are not the only group that can rise hell. It's time to rise up. Uh, although relatively few investigated uh, you know, the effect of election disinformation, 
due to uh, some methodological difficulties. Uh, some empirical evidence indicates that election disinformation has an impact on elections. Uh, for example, our own study of the effect of voter suppression has on um, actual voter turnout in 2016. Um, in our study of the 2016 election, we found that voter suppression ads were concentrated among non-white voters living in uh, minority counties in the battleground states. Uh, Non-whites in battleground states uh, received uh, nearly 10 times more voter suppression ads than whites in non-battleground states, for example. And then we tracked the actual turnout records of our participants uh, and then made the causal inferences on the effect of exposure to voter suppression ads on their turnout. Uh, and we found that exposure to voter suppression ads uh, alone decreased the turnout uh, by 3% when everything else, such as turnout history, party ID, uh, ideology, overall campaign exposure, digital media use uh, being equal. Uh, more importantly, the effects were even larger among the primary targets of border suppression that is non-whites in minority counties in the battleground states. So the border suppression uh, has targeted these groups, uh, decreased their uh, turnout, uh, actual turnout by 6% uh, when everything else being equal. So low preliminary, uh, our analysis of the 2020 election also indicates that uh, exposure to disinformation boosted by extremists and hate groups, like the examples I shared earlier, uh, explain the beliefs in uh, election legitimacy, even after controlling for the individual's party ID, ideology, and other demographic factors. Uh, in fact, exposure to election disinformation is likely to decrease the belief that the election results were uh, reliable almost by like a three points out of a five point scale. Uh, that's pretty much about it. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, present my research uh, and look forward to questions. Great, thank you very much, Professor Kim. Um, let me throw a couple out right away for you. Um, do you think disinformation uh, succeeds in changing allegiances of voters or does it only serve to kind of fuel the more partisan extremes of each party? That's a really good question. Uh, so disinformation, election disinformation in the digital age uh, utilize like a you know, targeting capacity of digital media and then algorithms. Uh, so unlike a broadcast media that uh, just to randomly just dis disseminate the information to the, uh, the general public, uh, disinformation campaigns in the digital media specifically target like a narrow segment of the part, uh, you know, population with the specific types of messages. So like my research shows, uh, those are usually uh, extremists uh, who care about um, rich issues or divisive issues um, and uh, extreme partisans. So I, I can see where analyzing any type of disinformation is useful to your work and can help deliver insights, but is it in any sense important that, you know, there's just so much information out there. Is it important to get a random sample of information for your work or does it suffice to just find a big chunk of what has happened and see what we can glean from that? I know in some areas of, of research, we're particularly concerned about random samples, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's obviously the case with what you do. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Like, if you, it actually like it depends on what kind of research questions do we want to primary uh, address. Uh, but um, you know, it, I believe like it is very important to have like a random sample or representative sample of the population to understand like a big picture or landscape of election disinformation. So, in uh, you know our study. Uh, actually used a representative sample of the U.S. voting age population uh, and it was like a 
pretty large sample compared to you know usual social science research is because again election disinformation uh, targets very narrow segment of the population with the specific information so to understand uh a variety of range of issues targeted a variety, uh, you know, various types of people. Uh, we need to have like a large uh, sample size, but also like a you know representative. So it is like a really big challenge. Uh, we have an audience question from Lou Blazik for you. Would you agree that the internet or social media has made it possible? that if you repeat a lie enough, it can become a truth? I suppose at least for some people, what are your thoughts on that? That's a very good question. Uh, yes, to, uh, my short answer would be like a yes, like a, to some degree, uh, because uh, you know one of the biggest differences uh, that uh, it, you know, existing in like a digital disinformation campaigns uh, compared to like a broadcasts, uh, uh, Messages, for example, broadcasted messages are, uh, you know, uh, available to anyone uh, and accessible. Therefore, like, researchers and journalists and investigators uh, can monitor uh, the true or false uh, the information. Uh, however, because the the nature of the, digital media and an algorithm is specifically target like a specific types of people. Uh, but these uh, these ads or you know messages only appear, uh, only shown to those who are targeted. Um, so there is uh, it is nearly impossible uh, for uh, you know, researchers outside the tech you know, platforms like uh, can observe uh, the the whole landscape of like a, you know, disinformation campaigns. Uh, so, given that we don't know who are what kind of different messages uh, others are getting, uh, you know, we could believe that this is just like you know uh, the word outside, and then this is like what actually happens. Uh, so, and then that. Also reinforces like you know people's predispositions uh, belief. Um, so uh, yeah, I agree that like to some extent uh, the internet or digital media and algorithm-based media uh, reinforces uh, and then make people believe that this is true. Thank you. I see we are bringing in all of our speakers now for a complete festival of Q and A. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move back to Nam Kim. We got a question about the relationship between warfare and the emergence of cities or early cities. Um, did they come out of uh, situations of warfare in some cases or to defend uh, populations? What, what, what kind of relationships do you see there? Uh, that, that's very, very Good question. There's, there's actually a strong correlation between the rise of quote unquote cities and civilizations and uh, the intensification of war. A lot of it depends on your definition, uh, what constitutes forms of warfare, what kinds of behaviors, what kinds of strategies are involved. But certainly with, with many cities, uh, we can see archaeologically, many of them were population centers that were quite uh, protected. We can see defensive architecture, there are massed armies that may be associated with these places. There might be refuges. So because of that, a lot of people tend to see the mid Holocene when we start to see the earliest states emerging as a sort of starting point for warfare. Um, I tend to view warfare in a more universal sense. So I see other kinds of activities that could be part of it that might be harder to detect in the archeological record. So warfare could be um, coming to us in earlier contexts, non-cities, uh, non-urban contexts, non-states. Um, there is plenty of potential evidence for that as well that's in the archaeological record. Great. A uh, question for Kristen from James Rotenberg. Professor Masters, how do 3D printers impact your research? Are they useful to what you do and do we have enough of them? <laughs> no, we don't have enough of them. and. Um, you know, ongoing developments in those are really helping us as well, because as you can imagine, the 
organs and tissues in your body are not these homogeneous masses, right? Yet some of the tools that we've been working with for years really just allow us to make fairly homogeneous tissues. And so what 3D printing is opening up to us now is being able to mimic the heterogeneity in tissues, which is really important for figuring out how they work and how they're becoming diseased. Thank you. We will work on getting you more printers, more 3D <laughs> printers. That's uh, something we can maybe help with. Uh, question for Young May from Brian Frona. Uh, how can we, uh, the academic community or social media uh, users, use the information that you've uncovered to change the discourse and return to a more fact-based dialogue? And I would just add on, if, if I may, is the regulation of content on platforms best done by the platforms or policymakers? Those are excellent questions. Uh, you know, first of all, um, we need to, like the public, especially like a civil society, including academic community, needs to monitor our information landscape, uh, including this like a digital uh, election disinformation. But again, it is incredibly challenging. Uh, to publicly monitor uh, this landscape of election disinformation just because uh, you know the, the data are not publicly accessible. Uh, so we need to uh, think creatively like, to uh, uh, come up with like a more uh, uh, groundbreaking like, methodologies. Uh, that's one thing we could do uh, as an academic uh, community members. Um, and uh, just for uh, combating with uh, combating against like a disinformation, uh, election disinformation in general, uh, we need to acknowledge that there are multi-level loopholes. Uh, so you know, as a citizen first, like we need to be more uh, literate uh, about like how digital media works, how platform works, and then. Uh, you know, do our own research beyond the digital media, uh, you know, use multiple sources to learn about politics and things like that. Uh, social media platforms, like, it needs to do, like, a better job. Uh, uh, currently, like, the social media platforms, like, heavily focusing on, like, fighting against, like, foreign actors. But my research shows that, like, the, the line between, like, foreign and domestic uh, disinformation is getting very blurry. Um, so we need like a more uh, comprehensive uh, and a consistent uh, you know, self-regulatory measures uh, and then transparent measures at the, uh, the social media platform level. But um, you know, to address your question, of Mike, I strongly believe that like, you know, policymakers need to work harder uh, to uh, come up with uh, the adequate law that addresses like digital uh, campaigns. Uh, you know, election uh, law. Uh, you know, the, unfortunately, we do not have like adequate like a campaign finance law or election law that addresses like a, uh, the campaigns in the digital age. Um, so, you know, for example, they could capture wire. Like some investigative journalist to reveal that. Uh, these uh, riots are in fact sponsored by super PAC. Uh, but uh, you know, because of the prevalence of like a dark money groups uh, do not reveal as sponsors and there is like, no clear requirements for that. Uh, so we see like more and more unregistered groups and groups who do not uh, not required to buy the FEC engage in like, election disinformation campaigns. Uh, so we need to have uh, uh, adequate like uh, policies that address like election campaigns uh, in the digital age. So would you recommend our viewers uh, go to Netflix and watch The Social Dilemma? I assume you've seen that. A yes, documentary. Like I, yeah, I highly recommend that. Again, I actually I got signed that uh, to like a, you know my. Uh, students like, uh, who are in disinformation, misinformation in the digital age at a class. That's like an advanced like undergrad and graduate seminar. Um, and then students um, uh, seem to really enjoy that. 
it's it's quite enlightening. Uh, highly recommended. Um, question from John Sievers that I will go around the horn to each of our speakers. Essentially, uh, we'd like to know what are some of the questions that you hope to tackle in your research in the years to come, and uh, how can the university help facilitate that work? So, what is on the horizon for you and uh, why don't we go in order uh, that we went this evening? So I'll start with Professor Masters. I will say that you know one of the reasons I love our research is because there there is never a lack of question biological questions to tackle, right? And so some of the, the directions that we're going in are trying to use some of our scaffold platforms that we've created to investigate a wider variety of diseases and. You know, I see that part of the question is about how does UW unique, uniquely provide the support for this. Um, I, one of the things that's quite lovely about working here is I know that pretty much no matter what disease I pick to want to investigate, I will be able to find people here that are experts in it, that can help me from the clinical side with respect to getting clinically relevant information that could eventually um, benefit patients, as well as people on, on in the uh, biological sciences that would also um, be able to contribute to the research. And so broadening our scope with respect to diseases, as well as actually something that we're going to be looking at that sounds a little bit boring perhaps, but is really essential, is trying to make these disease models also mimic aging. Because most of these diseases essentially fall on a background of aging. And aging is something that we really don't understand very well. Terrific. And do you need more 3D printers for that work? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Always. You can't have <laughs> too many of them. All right. Uh, Professor Nam Kim, uh, can you share a bit about your plans for the future and uh, how UW can help you? Sure. Um, I'd, I'd love to have a 3D printer as well, just for the record. <laughs> um, there are a couple of strands of research that I'm very interested in pursuing. Uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning, I have too many interests. Um, but one of the things that we're looking at is a sort of a follow-up to the warfare volume. And as I intimated, we see cooperative kinds of developments in our species evolutionary history as responsible to open, for opening the doorway to those kinds of behaviors. So the corollary to that is the constructions of peace. What kinds of peacemaking uh, behaviors can we make out in the archaeological record going back in time? Um, on the Vietnamese side of the research, I'm very interested in uh, exploring further uh, sites. It is a massive settlement and we are just scratching the surface. And a lot of the work that we're doing can benefit from the rich kinds of resources that are here on campus. So chemical analysis of artifacts, uh, there are a variety of institutions and units around campus that can help with that kind of research, um, soils analysis to help reconstruct ancient environments, giving us an idea of how people manage their landscapes around them, how their culture is adjusted to changing climates and so forth. Those kinds of questions uh, can be enriched by these, these collaborative uh, relationships. And archaeology is very much a collaborative kind of endeavor and enterprise. So those are the kinds of things that could be helpful. Um, I would also point out that having the area centers on campus is extremely important, um, focused on various world regions. So I'm affiliated with the Southeast Asia Center as well as the East Asia Center. Um, I also do work with the Biotech Center here on campus, uh, and we're involved with, uh, some of you may be familiar with the, um, the MIA uh, Recovery Ident Identification Program. Um, so that's another facet of research that, uh, and, and it's archaeology in practice, in fact, that, that is of interest for me as well. So just to give you an idea of all the kinds of rich activities that are happening around campus, um, there, whatever you want to do, you can find it. Well, thank you. And, and Young May, can you uh, close it off for us and give us an idea about your plans? Yeah, so I, uh, I'd like to continue to uh, investigate the election disinformation, uh, particularly the covered uh, influences by foreign actors uh, uh, and uh, targeted uh, you know, messages. Uh, and uh, in the long run, uh, beyond the election disinformation, uh, I'd like to explore the implications of uh, data-driven, algorithm-based uh, uh, campaigns uh, and how that leads to um, inequality uh, in political involvement. Uh, my previous research shows that, you know, 
these days like people are getting different amount like you know some people got like, a lot of like, uh, information campaign information some people uh got almost like a zero campaign uh information uh and so how's that related to their data use uh and algorithm and then uh their own like a uh, predisposition predispositions um you know these are uh you know obviously emerging issues uh so like, it uh requires like a creative and conceptualization theory building uh and uh develop some um uh, uh, met uh, novel methodological tools uh and then in fact like you know uh the uw um Especially like alumni foundation uh, so support that like, was very helpful. Like you know, uh, the I like five or six years ago when uh, I came up with this idea about um, uh, looking at the like, micro targeting and uh, disinformation campaigns and digital media. No one actually believed me. Uh, it's a problem because uh, people only. Uh, reflect uh, only think about the world outside based on what uh, they've seen on the digital media. So I applied, I wrote like a, you know, dozens of grant applications and I sent it out like a multiple private foundations and then they never uh, saw any like, you know, uh, anti-immigration, uh, anti uh non-white like anti you know racial like a messages uh so they didn't believe that but fortunately like a uw foundation uh alumni foundation like I supported my research and then that was like a you know, beginning of the uh this uh big project uh so i really appreciate that and then uh i wish to continue to support uh for uh uh more groundbreaking of the research uh, and uh, the research that has like a big impact on the society uh, that fits with the like, Wisconsin idea. Great. Well, uh, thank you all. I know we're past the top of the hour and we've got a few more things to tend to tonight, but I just want to extend my heartfelt thanks for all of you to take the time this evening to be part of our special Founders Day edition. Our, our team did a great job, I think, of uh, making some selections that really represent the vast breadth of what goes on at the university. And I know I learned a lot from this and I'm sure our audience members did too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you for having us. The UW Now will be back again next Tuesday, February 9th when we turn our attention inward and do some sifting and winnowing at the very foundations of the university itself that is its governance and financial model within the UW system. In particular, I will have a distinguished panel on hand to discuss the recent falling behind report, a study of the UW system and its performance in recent years. UW law graduate and Regent Vice President Michael Greeby and several other distinguished panelists will join me to discuss the future of higher education in our state university system. I invite you to stay on for our video uh, closing tonight, and I thank all of you for joining us, and again, on Wisconsin. This is our story. It's a story of people coming from around the corner and across the globe. Driven by a desire to create, to grow, to explore, to transform. It began on February 5th, 1849. With just 20 students and one professor. Today, it's a thunderous saga of more than 450,000 living alumni and countless ideas and discoveries that have changed the course of history. Everywhere we go, we carry the Wisconsin story with us. And whenever we meet a fellow Badger, whether we're back on Baskin Hill, on the other side of the planet, or making a virtual connection, we invoke the spirit of that very first class. This is our story.
This is our university. This is Founders Day.